It's a Conspiracy is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network. For other fun programming, please check out albertapodcastnetwork.com where you can find shows like the Mess Hall Podcast. It's a conspiracy! I'm just going to put up my pop screen. Episode 12. My pop screen on because this this episode's all about peppers and popcorn and ponies <laughs> and <laughs> parties and puppy parties. Okay, you guys like puppy parties? Who doesn't yeah, like huh? a good pe- pop, puppy pop. party? Yeah, that'd be awesome. So, better living through Morganite. Welcome back, everyone, to It's Conspiracy. This is the podcast where we lay out the beliefs behind selected conspiracy theories, alternative accounts, legends, myths, and more. I'm your host Andrew, and I do not claim to be an expert on anything we're going to discuss today. And we'll probably be wrong about everything because I was too annoyed after a failed attempt at making my own banana chips to write this out properly. My oven is supposed to be like a hybrid dehydrator, but clearly that claim is dubious. Dubious, I say. So I'm a little frustrated about that. Still hanging on to that anger. Have you guys ever made banana chips before? You said a whole bunch of weird things in that statement. Yeah. Yeah, You're try to make banana, banana chips. Banana chips in your yeah. oven slash dehydrator? What's going so on my, there at this My oven house? claims to be a, a hybrid dehydrator. What? Is this like the step beyond like an air fryer? This is above and beyond the air fryer. That's what? that's a whole step we're at a beyond. whole other level here. So like the air fr- air fryer is like, you know, here's here's a little taste. Now get into that dehydrator, baby. Dehydrators are amazing. But my oven's not a dehydrator, even though it claims to be a hybrid dehydrator. <laughs> a hybrid dater. As always, if you would like to see where we got the elusive dried out flakes of deliciousness that we are going to chomp on after rehydrating them properly, then please check out the episode description. Lord Charlie thinks he's so fancy because he's been able to use his dehydrator and make his own banana chips. And that's great. He can have them. He can have all of them. In fact, I'll show you where those bananas go, buddy. Hey, 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 ho. Hey, <laughs> Keep away from my banana chips. <clears throat> uh, and we are a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network. Yay team, yay friends, yay squad. They're uh, they're good people over there. You can check us out at itsaconspiracypodcast.com. Our Twitter at Is It A Conspiracy? That's run by the social media influencer, Ziadish Madman. Our Facebook group, our Instagram, that's run by Gorgeous Greg. That's It's A Conspiracy Podcast. Uh, our email and our Patreon page, patreon.com slash It's A Conspiracy. Slapping right on. So, righty then, joining the online distance communication time today is his lordship, charming Charles and gorgeous Greg. These kyber crystals are going to interject as they see fit. And I do so appreciate their socially distanced digital company. We're all in this together. I think we all feel okay today. Are we all back to feel like a 21 year old man? This guy's yeah. like a million bucks over here. And you were saying that you got like right sluice oh, last I, night. I like, I went out when and I, I don't, I don't remember getting home. <laughs> yeah, I know that's not something to, that's not something to be proud of. Like I made it home. You made it home I safe. Woke up, I woke up and I felt it was like, hey man, what are, what are we doing today? Nice. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. I haven't felt this good after a night of drinking since I was like 21, where your body was like, I don't know what's going on. So <laughs> you get a free pass today. Since you're 21, since yeah. the summer of 2019. <laughs> I thought it was like last year. <laughs> now I'm very I, I'm glad that you feel good, man. That's always good. Charlie, with a good or a bad, can you tell me if you've heard of either of these, try either of these theories, actually? Uh, number one, what is North Sentinel Island? Bad. Bad. Okay. Number two, a moment of Greg. Bad. Okay. Number three, five real life cyborgs. Oh, bad. I haven't heard of any of these things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited. Okay, that man. Here we go. Good. Uh, subject number one. What is North Sentinel Island? Is this an X-Men thing? It sounds like an X-Men thing. You absolutely nailed it. Okay. North Sentinel Island. And this is what I wrote, man. It sounds like an industrial complex from one of the X-Men movies. Hey. Totally, right? Dang. Synchronicity. Uh, But it's actually one of the Andaman Islands from the Bay of Bengal in the Indian Ocean. Also, 
It is one of the world's few forbidden islands. Wait, do you say it again? Say forbidden. Oh, sorry. Okay. Do you have so? Okay. Also, it is one of the world's few forbidden islands. Now, in 1956, the government of India made it illegal for anyone to travel within three miles of the island. And since then, there really has not been any continuous contact with the inhabitants to the point that even the population of North Sentinel Island is a mystery. So the official estimates range from somewhere between 15 and 500 people. They're, they're, there's nobody knows. Wait, 15 to 500 people? So between 15 and 500 people. They're like, there's at least 15, maybe. There could and be more. There could be more, as many as 500. Oh, I see. In 2001, the official census of India recorded 21 men. Uh, so 21 men and 18 women. 2011, uh, the official census recorded 12 men and three women. And then a 2014 sample said there was six females, seven males, and three children under the age of four. And that was it. So it sounds like there's actually not a lot of people there. No. This is all done from outside of the three-mile zone, so it's really impossible to know how accurate it is. The island, you can see like the beach going around it, and then there's just this super thick forest line, and you can't see anything. So they they can't tell. There could be all kinds of stuff happening under the tree line, but all they can see is the beach trees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like Wakanda. It, there's a lot of Wakanda stuff going on here. This actually reminds me a lot of Greg's favorite show, Lost. I fucking love that show. I love that show too. <laughs> <laughs> that was so good, the there was some pretty, uh, pretty awesome stuff for that show, man. Now well, that you mentioned it, you're right. It didn't end so good. It kind of ended like ungood. It kind of it sounds like me. an opinion to me. Oh, yeah, I know. The, the ride was worth the the. Time. Yeah, it was worth the fare for yeah. sure. A few years ago, there was an attempt to survey the island using satellite imaging. But the only thing visible from above was the incredibly dense plant life and the outer ring of the shore. The Sentinelese are not an agricultural people and instead prefer to hunt using bone arrows for wildlife on the island and rudimentary fishing methods to catch mollusks, which make up the bulk of their diet. That word is so hard to say without tripping on mollusks. Mollusks? Mollusks. Mollusks? Yeah. Uh, their language is unclassified and has been proven to be entirely independent of the Jarawa language, which is their nearest neighbors. There may be some language overlap with a tribe called the Onga, but a 2016 study of vulnerable tribal groups found them to be mutually unintelligible. So somehow they were like, we can have contact with the Onga people, but they're not exactly sure if the people on North Sentinel Island would understand what the Onga people were saying, like if there's any kind of linguistic relations there. It would be like English today versus English like 500 years ago. Yeah. Maybe even more distant, like more like when you're reading German and every once in a while, you're like, does that, is that the word welcome? Welcome. Yeah. welcome. Unlike the Anga and the Jarawa, they refuse any contact with the outside world and have killed a number of people who have dared to approach the, uh, the island by land, by sea, by air. They are very, very aggressive. One of the first recorded events of this is from 1867 when the Indian merchant vessel Nineveh was beached by accident. They presumed the island to be abandoned and they set up a little camp. On the third day, they were viciously attacked by a group of naked, short-haired, red-painted islanders with arrows made of iron. In 1880, British Royal Navyman Maurice Vidal Portman made contact took a crew of soldiers onto the island and did a bit of uh, the old exploring. Got, got his bloody boots on it, you know? <laughs> he claims to have found a number of abandoned villages and pathways, so he thought the island was... Uh, all the people had died or left. He later stumbled across a small group, two adults and four children, and decided, hey, why don't I just abduct these people, put them in my boat, sail away? That's fine. That's okay. Like that's completely respecting their, their rights. And within days of being on his ship, the two adults died of a mysterious illness and the children like started to get super sick. And they were like, we're going to have a bunch of a uh, bunch of dead kids here right away. So Portman returned to the Island, sent the kids back ashore with a number of gifts as he wrote uh, as an apology. And he wrote in his journal that he appreciated their peculiar idiotic expression of countenance and manner of behavior. So he said they were peculiarly idiotic was his, his, his observation. They, they, just lets, they don't understand why you just stole them. Yeah. Yeah. Come sail away plays in the background. And the adults they were with, 
are dead. Yeah, and they're like, no here's hey, after a day or two of that, go. they say, oh. hey, you can go back home now. Totally. Here's a bag of popcorn. Sorry about your sorry about your mom and dad. Head on the head. See you later. <laughs> now, this account has led some to believe that there is something supernatural about the people there. And the connection to the island is more than it seems. In 1896, this is awesome. In 1896, an inmate on a nearby island prison escaped, got into the water, tried to swim to a, like a freedom, right? He lands on North Sentinel Island by mistake, and he was found on the beach a few days later, covered in arrows with a slit throat, just lying Arrow. there on the rocks. So there's a story somewhere there. <laughs> There's our guy with the an idiotic with the look on his him. face. Like, I, don't, I don't remember Papillon ending that way. <laughs> in 1899, Richard Karnak Temple, the chief commissioner of the Andaman Islands, reported that the Sentinelese were a tribe which slays every stranger, however inoffensive, on sight, whether a forgotten member of itself, another Andamanese tribe, or a complete foreigner. So they just kill everybody. Hold on a second. What, what did you say that? The person who just quoted that, what was his name? Something his, Karnak? His name was Richard Karnak Temple. You think his friends called him uh, Dick Temple for short? <laughs> Dick Temple. <laughs> I love how proud of yourself that you are of that. <laughs> uh, in, in 1974, National Geographic sent a crew uh, along with an armed guard to the island for a short documentary. The crew landed on the shore and began to offer a series of gifts, including a live pig, some coconuts, a doll, and some aluminum cookware. As the director was putting the gifts down on the beach, he was shot in the leg by an arrow, and the film crew could hear a number of people cheering from the trees nearby. So they didn't see anyone. They just heard like, hooray, hey, we got, got him, him right in the leg. Again, all right. <laughs> uh, after that, a volley of arrows rained down on the crew, which injured many of them. Uh, the pig was unfortunately speared to the ground right through the neck. So, <laughs> yikes. Uh, and everyone quickly abandoned the project. During their retreat, one of the quick photographers from National Geographic had the sense to take a picture of the people shooting at them. Um, they got an astounding picture of three of the warriors, and it became the first widely publicized photograph of the Sentinelese. Okay, so I'm just going to show you guys this here. Pretty exciting stuff. They keep shooting us with arrows. So this is them here. So they look very victorious, don't they? Like, that'll yeah. teach you. Stay out of, <laughs> stay out of Shelbyville. Stay out of Central. <laughs> this is our island. In 1981, an Australian ship was wrecked just off the shores of the island, and the crew were able to escape despite being attacked multiple times. Uh, shortly after that, researchers noticed the Sentinelese pouring over the ship and taking whatever scraps they could. Interestingly, for a brief time, the islanders seemed somewhat open to the concept of gift exchange with foreigners. This culminated in an actual hand-to-hand -hand exchange of coconuts in 1991, in which the director of the 1974 National Geographic documentary was actually present. So he came back to the island like 17 years later, and he's like, hey, here's some coconuts. Remember me? Sorry about that earlier. <clears throat> You think that those guys were like, uh, why is this guy giving us coconuts? We already yeah. have coconuts. Totally. We, and didn't we, we put an arrow in his more. leg last time? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you want one for the other leg, buddy? I think we got to give him another shot, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the islanders found the plane. They're like, man, there's all kinds of cool stuff on the outside of this. Let's 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 steal this and like make what we can out of it. And they were like, we should accept gifts from these people who keep coming. They so keep they bring shit that we don't want, but. But they, they were like, maybe it's this free. stuff is good. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they appreciated the value of trade and were open to visitors. However, in 1997, uh, those wet blankets of the Indian government officially ended any contact, including research or humanitarian services. The logic at the time was that even something as simple as a gift exchange of coconuts could end up exposing the islanders to viruses and bacteria, if you believe in viruses and bacteria, <laughs> that could uh, decimate their immunocompromised population. Now, fast forward to 2006, two Indian fishermen looking for crabs off the shore of North Sentinel Island were attacked and killed by a group of warriors with axes. Wow. The bodies, the bodies of the two men were put up on giant bamboo stakes facing out to the sea. And this became a media sensation in India. And the Coast Guard responded by sending a small group on a helicopter to retrieve the bodies. When the helicopter approached, 
A number of Sentinelese ran out to the beach throwing rocks and spears and shooting their bows and arrows. And the attack was so vicious that the helicopter was damaged and the crew had to fly back to uh, the Bay of Bengal on the other side without getting the bodies. So they weren't able to retrieve the two fishermen's bodies. Then 12 years later, in 2018, John Chow, a 26-year-old American and self-proclaimed missionary, decided to travel to the island to contact the people and live among them in hopes of converting them to Christianity. He traveled to the Andaman Islands and paid a group of local fishermen approximately $30,000 each to take him within canoe range of the island. On the 15th of November, he went ashore and approached a number of villagers. He wrote that they responded to him with a mix of amusement, confusion, and hostility. And he was offering them a bunch of gifts. And then at some point, he had a Bible with him, holding it up in front of him. And uh, when they saw that, they shot an arrow at him, which pierced the Bible. And he's like, okay. And he put it back in his pocket, went back to his canoe, and returned to the fishermen. So he's like, oh, I don't. Right. See you later. Yeah. <laughs> Take her easy. Big gulps, huh? Big gulps. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, and that was the 15th of November. On the 17th of November, he decided to try again. And uh, shortly before landing, he took this picture of himself. So he snapped a quick canoe selfie. Let's just get this going here. Can you believe these guys? (laughs) (laughs) So here he is here. This is one of the fishermen he paid a whole bunch of money to. This is John Chow here. All righty. And uh, after a quick boat selfie, he asked the fisherman to wait close by in case he had to make another quick retreat. So the fisherman saw him land on the shore. He had his bags with him with the gifts. And he saw the, the group come out from the tree line and sort of surround Chow. And they all moved back into the trees. A few minutes later, a number of the villagers emerged from the trees. And the fisherman could see one of the warriors dragging Chow's dead body behind him. I just kind of... Got him by the ankle, dragging him over the rocks. I think this totally is dead. Noise. Yeah. The warriors stood defiantly on the beach and made what the fishermen described as obscene gestures towards the men in the boats. And so the fishermen were like, all right, peace out. See you later. We got to go. <laughs> Ciao. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That's such a bad fucking joke. <laughs> oh, no, that's good. That's good. So the, the fishermen went back to the mainland <laughs> and they notified police and the police were like, you're arrested. We've told you never to go there. And also, did you say that guy was American? Because now we got a whole new can of worms on our hands here. Um, investigators from the Coast Guard sent a ship out to the island and saw that Chow's body was still laying on the shore. And amazingly, after a short conversation between the Indian and American government, the decision was was made that there would be too much of a clash between investigators and the islanders. So there was no retrieval attempt made or any kind of inquiry launched. Chow's remains are still on the island. His remains remain. His remains remain. Yeah. Now, many theories have popped up about the island in recent years, including dinosaurs, a crashed UFO, a last holdout of some extinct human ancestor, a cosmic mine, ooh, a time machine, the Garden of Eden, the actual location of Atlantis, and some kind of Wakanda-style futuristic city shrouded in secrecy. Now, whatever's happening there, the fact is that the fact that no one knows anything about the island at all is very strange. And it is baffling that the American government would be so cooperative after one of their citizens was murdered there to the point that they didn't even bother to like try to retrieve the body. They're like, ah, we'll just leave them on the rocks there. (laughs) It's you'd think that like team America would burst in there and just start cracking skulls, but they, they sure didn't not this time. Uh, Now, just a quick end note. There have been an abundance of rumors from from people who have been reading about this over the years saying that um, there's cannibalism happening on North Sentinel Island, but uh, there has been no documented evidence of this and the bodies of both the fishermen and Chow in 2018 were uh, were displayed in a way that they showed that at least those three people were uh, were left with their bodies intact. So they're probably not cannibals, but they're clearly fed up with people. (laughs) (laughs) Is that what you want? Darling, you were you, you were could on just point that, brother. I knew it was coming. You knew it was coming. <laughs> I was. I, I knew it was somewhere in there. I knew it. I'll just get the bad joke sound here and <laughs> bingo. Go. So yeah, that's North Sentinel Island. Yikes, scary place. Close to India. And uh, have you guys ever heard of that before? 
I'm not heard of the that X-Men. place before. No, I, I have. I have heard about this the, this group of people, and I was heard about I was really waiting for you to bring up the the, the fact that that like, come on, man, we don't need missionaries to go do stuff like that anymore. It yeah. It had bad idea written all over it from the very beginning. It just wasn't. Uh... How many times does someone have to say "screw off" before you get to get the hint? Huh? Yeah. Huh? Especially they're very, they're very. They're, there's no gray zone there. They're like, if anyone comes near here, we're gonna try to kill you. Yeah. yeah. Try. We invite you over the one time we let you in. You gave us coconuts. You see what we have here? It's an <laughs> island of coconuts, buddy. <laughs> Let's hold on to our opinions here. Getting rather opiniony in here. Right. Uh, okay, so uh, speaking of opinions, Charlie, what are we? Uh, what are we? What are we drinking? What are we drinking? What are we drinking or drinking? Well, in my opinion, <laughs> <laughs> I am drinking. Uh, you know, we are recording on a Sunday early afternoon, mm-hmm. and I am drinking a hot apple cider out of my lovely "It's a Conspiracy" mug available at OldManDesign.com. However, for the occasion, it is spiked. With a little bit of uh, fireball whiskey. Oh. What you have here is a smooth whiskey with a fiery kick of red hot cinnamon. It tastes like heaven, burns like hell. What <laughs> happens next is up to you. We like a bad night when you're 17. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Fireball, man. Like Fireball. Oh. I recently, as of uh, Friday evening, actually, I enjoyed one of these guys here. So this is uh, this is Fernie Brewing. So it's in Fernie, uh, just on the other side of the Crow's Nest Pass in British Columbia, beautiful British Columbia. And I had this guy here, the <laughs> what the huck Huckleberry Ale, nice. and uh, Ale definitely have another one. It was spectacular. So I didn't know that I liked Huckleberry so much. Right, super good. I'm your Huckleberry. I'll be your huckleberry. Native to the Rocky Mountain region, the huckleberry is prized for its sweetness and deep color, blended with wheat to create a smooth and creamy beer with a touch of huckleberries added post-fermentation to ensure the deep color and slight sweetness of the berries remain. A year-round Fernie favorite. I would love to go to the Fernie Brewery, Fernie Brewing Brewery. But uh, the one that I had here was from my liquor store here in Beaumont, and it was sensational. The best thing about this, you can buy just one can. Just so one it's like, can. have one. You don't just need to a buy a whole, just a taster, right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes you buy six of these and you're like, what am I going to do with the other five and a half? But mm-hmm. yeah. But not this time. Not this time. Actually, that would be a very rare thing that I would buy six <laughs> and be like, I'm not going to finish this. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Right. And Greg, what are you? What are we drinking? The one thing I do remember from last night was what I was drinking. Which was uh, Belching Beaver Peanut Butter Milk Stout. Oh, my. <laughs> um, dangerous, dangerous stuff. Coming in at 5.3% uh, alcohol content. Uh, with cascading aromas of buttery peanuts and dark chocolate, this milk stout is highly coveted by all beer drinkers. And, um, yeah, I can't disagree with that. It's so tasty. I know I've probably talked about it before, and you'll, you've made fun of me for all the weird beers that I like to drink that aren't IPAs. Um, mm-hmm. This is by far probably my favorite beer. Um, hopefully, it never stops being made. Wow! And it's from Belching Beaver. Belching yeah, which Beaver. I believe is located in California. Oh, really? So yeah, this is not a local beer by any means whatsoever. Get that does sound like a Canadian. Uh, well, doesn't uh, you, like you and, throw the beaver part in there, and yeah, of course, sure. it sounds Canadian. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Whatever, man. Maybe it's a bunch of Canadians down in uh, down in Cali that are like, "Yo, changing it up." I mean, you know, beavers aren't only in Canada. No, Beavers I'm pretty sure. Around. I'm pretty that's sure they, they don't. They don't. Yeah, they they stay. They don't have passports, yeah. man. Beavers yeah. talking about. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, like I said, one of my favorite beers, man. If you if you're into stouts and you like peanut butter, put that two together, baby. That sounds like a lot. It sounds like a, a heavier sort of thing. It definitely is. It's not like well, I wouldn't recommend drinking it all night, even though I did that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but it's but it's one of those beers you you can like. You get a glass and it's like an hour and a half later, you finally finished it. It's like a session kind of thing, you know? Right. Like a, like a discussion beer when you want (laughs) to swirl it around and have a slow chat with someone. Yeah. And you want to look cool while you say some stuff. Yeah. Well, let me just look at the the foam here. (laughs) Not like a stressed out. I need to drink five things. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, that's what I was drinking. Uh, Okay, cool. Well, that's going to take us. All the way to ad number one. Get ready to take the guesswork out of choosing a school. Go to an Edmonton Public Schools virtual open house. 
ask your questions to learn about their schools and programs, and find the one that feels right. All from the comfort of home. Find virtual event dates and learn how to make the most out of your online visit at openhouse.epsb.ca. Know before you go and feel confident and excited when you get there. <laughs> That's going to bring us to subject number two. This is a moment of Gorgeous Greg with Gorgeous Greg. Moments of Greg. Greg. Ooh. All right. I don't know if you guys, how much you guys are into sports. I know, Andrew, yourself, you're an Oilers fan. I do. I do like the Oilers. Charles, I know you're a sports ball fan. Uh, yeah, I'm a sports entertainment fan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so you, you know how you have your favorite team and it always just seems like there is a bias against your team by the referees or the organization. It doesn't matter which team you cheer for. Everybody's against you. Mm-hmm. I have actual data. Greg gets put um, in the work. Yep. Yeah, I put in the work by stealing it from somebody else. That's how you move ahead in 2021. 22, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Every year um, it is. But it is about one of my favorite uh, favorite teams. Uh, I am a Las Vegas Raiders fan, which is part of the NFL. I figured with the Super Bowl coming up and uh, the season that the Raiders have had, which has just been atrocious, um, they you know they made it to the playoffs and everything, but they had to overcome a lot of things. Uh, I ended up finding an article that talks about how the Oakland Raiders, Las Vegas Raiders, are the most penalized team in all of the NFL, and the officiating is biased against them. So a recent report by ethicalskeptic.com lays out an argument and lots of data to show the bias against the Raiders is indeed real. In the report, the site and its analyst, a former naval intelligence officer and current corporate strategy executive, so obviously he knows what he's talking about, lays out the case. And before you toss out the argument as ludicrous or impossible, it's helpful to understand the methodology and approach ethical skeptic used when putting the Raiders penalty of affliction under the microscope. Uh, ethical skeptic first looked at 2019 season. And again, the Raiders led the league in penalties for the majority of the season. Not only were they the most penalized, but these penalties came at times often directly correlating to a win versus a loss. So it's not like these were just like, oh, it's a minor penalty. It's like, no major play was made. Now there's a penalty, that major play doesn't exist anymore, and you're back at square zero. Not only does the data show the Raiders being the most penalized team, but it also shows the least penalized team in the NFL is whatever team plays the Raiders each week. Oh, boy. (laughs) Uh, Before you say, well, the Raiders are just an undisciplined and penalties are their own fault, Ethical Skeptic looked at that. And basically what he means by undisciplined penalties are like offsides which you just you know moved before you were allowed to too many men on the field obviously against the rules that is not an issue for the raiders they are very disciplined these are all just penalties that are usually not called or if they are called it's with a play that really didn't mean anything like one yard and i'm gonna try and do a good voice for this one. Oh, here we go <laughs> JFK. It's the JFK. I labored under the myth for decades. This year, when I looked at the penalties, I defined a class of penalty called the discipline class. That's a class of penalties like delay a game, too many players on the field, neutral zone infractions, yada, yada, yada. All those (laughs) things the fans can easily see on TV and easy to pick off those penalties. These are the indicators of the team's discipline and coaching and discipline in regard to that type of penalty and control their game. Surprisingly, when I looked at those classes of penalties for the Raiders, they were 80% of the NFL average. In other words, they were in the top third in discipline when it comes to those types of penalties. So like I said, they were just, they're a great team. They're just getting shit on by their reps in the organization. So if the Raiders don't have a discipline problem or one where they're getting penalties for a lack of discipline, then when are they getting all these penalties? The vast majority of the penalty incident imbalances involve calls of merely subtle interpretation. So the rules are laid out for everybody to read in a book. It's just for the refs to interpret whether that situation applies to what happened on the field. Uh, With these types of penalties, the Raiders are penalized at double the rate of the NFL average, especially as it pertains to first downs, automatic first downs, and scoring drive sustaining penalties. So basically... If you're a Raiders fan, life is hard because you're just, everybody's against you. A lot of this dates back to what people believe would be when Al Davis, who was the owner of the Raiders, went against the NFL and sued them because he wanted to move his team from Las Vegas, or sorry, from Oakland to uh, to LA, mainly because all they wanted was a new uh, new arena. 
So what he did, he was like, hey, if you don't give me the money, I'm going to just sue you guys and then I'll get the money and I'll go build my own arena. They didn't allow that. So they moved him to L.A. They tried the same thing there. And basically he was like, well, if you're not going to give me the money for this, I'll just go back to Oakland and I'll get your money and I'll build my own arena. None of that ever happened. But Al Davis did win uh, his case against the NFL and has basically pretty much black marked the Raiders because of that ever since then. Mm, It's a real take my ball and go home kind of guy. Yeah. Pretty much, pretty much. Um, you know, it's when when your uh, when your strategy is just win, that doesn't always work. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's actual data and facts which you can find. I'm going to be giving to Charlie. You can find them in our podcast notes and stuff because I don't know. Apparently, Charlie does that. I've never seen it. <laughs> <laughs> the note. What? Ouch! Ouch! The notes. Look at the notes. <laughs> but yeah, there's a lot of analytics there which I don't understand. But basically, what this article is saying and what I found out and personally seen myself is that there is a bias against certain teams in any league that you might be interested in and there always will be so hopefully you know you have a team that you cheer for besides the patriots you know <laughs> hot, hot takes yeah yeah jeez i uh i guess we're not in opinion time i, I, I feel like like yeah, yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna bottle it up keep it into your hat <laughs> yeah like it, i don't know a lot of people out there but as an oilers fan like you just yeah, they're so oh. against us, man. <laughs> <laughs> I know why. Uh, I, I I understand why, and I, but I'll save it for for the opinion time. Pretty much my spiel about how uh, everybody hates us. So <laughs> that was momentous, fantastic. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, that's going to take us straight into subject numero two. Good thing I have my pop screen here. Please pardon this patriotic uh, predominance. Pathologists, palmatologists, and other practitioners are uh, puzzled by the particular field. I like to participate by post pizza puppy party. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So what we're going to talk about here is five real life cyborgs. You should probably move. Okay. Now, first of all, cyborgs, what is a cyborg and what is a robot? Are they different? Yes. Yes, they are. Damn it. Actually, can either of you tell me what cyborg means? Cybernetic organism. Cybernetic organism. And a robot is entirely mechanical. Yeah. Now, if that's confusing, the, let me just give you one thousand. That's right. Now, so for, so for example, Darth Vader, a guy, he gets all of his uh, pickles and bits he gets his uh, and chopped off. And he gets, yeah, that's <laughs> right. He was he was volcanoed and then he was lavaed. So he all of his stuff got chopped and burned before he was rescued and brought back to life with robotic parts. So he's part man, part machine, all cop. That's a cyborg. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, R2-D2. So he's an astromech droid that is entirely robotic. There's nothing living inside of him. Like if you opened up his little cabinet on the front, there's not like intestines or any kind of living. He's not full of guts. Organic matter. Organic matter. There's no organic matter. Yeah. However, that said, he's clearly got a soul and, you know, a heart. You know what I mean? R2-D2? Come on, you guys. What? Saves the day every time. Anyway, has got a great sense of humor. That's what he does. Yeah, sassy. Sassy little (laughs) robot. He's going to be waiting for us in heaven one day. Um, Okay. Now, there is a weird... I've always wondered about this because... So, the Terminator is clearly a robot. No, he's a cybernetic organism. Because he's covered with human flesh. He's covered in human flesh. But in the beginning of Terminator 2, there's a bunch of robots. Spoiler. The beginning of T2, there's, <laughs> there's a whole of bunch the of Terminators, and they're walking around with machine guns, just blasting apart people. So those are robots. But when they get like, you know, the the people parts put on them, they become cyborgs. Well, doesn't, so, isn't the other thing in there in Terminator 2, like he has a chip that allows him to learn? His learning program. That's right. That doesn't make him human. Just have no, him I didn't say human, but like a, the cyborg, maybe. He might have like a like a real kidney inside of him somewhere just to keep things just so like perspective <laughs> or just a, just a I spleen. Go to the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in 2021, sorry, in 2022, Electric Boogaloo, there are actually cyborgs among us. And here are five of them. So number one, Neil Harbison. This guy, he has an antenna in the back of his head to help him with his achromatopsia which is an extreme color blindness he can only see in black and white he uses this is amazing this is what he's nicknamed his attachment he uses his eyeborg <laughs> to perceive colors as musical notes so this thing is like sticking out of the top of his head and it's like this little antenna and um 
All the colors that are within his field of vision are represented by notes. He believes humans have a duty to use technology to transcend themselves, which is scary. So here we go to the next one. Transcend. It's all about transcending mechanically to the next level. Dr. Kevin Warwick. This guy calls himself Captain Cyborg. That's, that's a little presumptuous, but that's pretty amazing at the same time. He's been using implants in his body to help him control lights, computers, and heaters in his home since the late 90s. He even gave one to his wife. And this is a little creepy. Uh, he got an implant put in his wife, which tells him what it feels like when someone else touches her. <laughs> oh, wow. Jesus. I don't know. Yeah. So some kind of biometric feedback thing, like when someone touches her, he can feel it. Okay. So we're two in. This is. She, did yeah. she agree to this? <laughs> I, I, hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Okay. Uh, Jesse Sullivan. That's a great name. Great wrestler name. And uh, this one really sounds like like the origin of like a Spider-Man villain. Okay, May 2001, he was electrocuted so badly that both of his arms had to be removed. Of course, they grew back afterwards. <laughs> I'm just kidding. They didn't actually. Okay, so his, his arms had to be removed. <laughs> I'm supposed to be laughing about this guy. I know, I'm sorry. That's a, okay. So he was electrocuted really bad and his arms had to get chopped off. So the Rehabilitation <laughs> Institute of Chicago, they offered him a unique once in a lifetime offer. So they're like, we don't normally do this, but you seem like a really nice guy. They replaced both of his arms with robotic prosthetics, which react to mind control. So it turns out, and this happens right now, if we, if we think about moving our arms, a bunch of tiny little muscles in our chest, like get activated and start like, oh, oh getting all excited and running around. So um, that's how these there's little sensors on the muscles in his chest. And whenever he thinks about moving his arms, these little guys start moving and then his robotic arms start doing their thing. They're set to kill. Oh, no. <laughs> so he has super strong robot arms. OK, number four, Professor Steve Mann. That's another great name. There's a lot, a lot of great <laughs> names here. Professor Mann. Um, this one's a Canadian. So that's great. He began experimenting with what he called wearable computing in the 70s so can you imagine how heavy those ram drives and <laughs> tape decks would be oh and he had them on his body so he was also on the receiving end of the world's first recorded anti-cyborg hate crime in 2012 when three mcdonald's employees attempted to by force remove the digital eyeglass he had oh. implanted in his head so they tried to take it out for some reason uh, that reminds me a lot of the time a friend of mine, this is a true story, he wore his Nintendo Power Glove to school and he was mocked relentlessly. We were in yeah, grade oh four. Shit. Pretty <laughs> much the same thing, I think, isn't it? Just a power move. All right, Infinity now this... Infinity Gauntlet. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are laughing now, but watch. Uh, this guy here, this is another, this might be the, the, the name winner here. Stelios Arcadio. Stelios He's a performance under artist and he performs under the name Stellark. And he believes that his human body is obsolete. Now, as proof of this, he recently had an artificial ear grafted onto his left arm. So I'm just going to show you guys this picture here. <laughs> so he's like, this will be funny. Like this will, you know, might get me some free drinks somewhere and just get people laughing away. That was his body modification. He did it for art. He did it for the sake of art. And is he talking into it? Yellow. Anyway, so that's uh, his main act is an online show in which he hooks up electrodes to different parts of his body. We're talking uptown, downtown, the whole, you know, whole whole, the whole shebang. <laughs> uh, the, electro go, the electrodes go to different parts of his body and he allows online users to control his body movements. So you, if you pay... You can control his body from the comfort of your very own rumpus room. He was quoted as saying, we shouldn't have a Frankensteinian fear of incorporating technology into the body. My attitude is that technology is and always has been an appendage of the body. His, his friends, his, the online users were reported as saying, stop hitting yourself. Stop hitting yourself. Stop hitting yourself. <laughs> <laughs> It's perform. I, it's performance. <laughs> Ow. 
I just wonder how far you could go with that. Like, could you get the guy to like, you're like, I'm going to join in. And now you're going to come over here and mow my lawn. And he'll be like, I don't want to. I'm <laughs> doing this against my will. Yeah. <laughs> Lawnmower man part two. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's five real life cyborgs. Hooray! And that's going to take us to advertisement number two. Did you know that you have a superpower? No, we're not talking about flying or reading minds, although those would be pretty cool to have. You have the incredible ability to help young people see their own superpowers. Boys and Girls Clubs and Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Edmonton and area, also called BGC Bigs, needs you now. Over the past year, BGC Bigs heard from young people that having a mentor means that they are less likely to have anxiety, feel isolated or struggle with their mental health. But there are over 600 young people waiting for a mentor in their lives today. Explore how you can get involved and watch our community change one life at a time. There is currently a need for mentors in the Big Brothers, Big Sisters or Big Siblings program, in school, for our Youth in Care program and for the new prison program supporting 2SLGBTQ plus young people. There is also a need for virtual tutors who can support young people as they transition back to school and are dealing with the learning loss over the past two years. Join BGC Biggs for a virtual coffee or apply now at bgcbigs.ca or Google BGC Biggs Edmonton. Your priority, their future. Opinion time, opinion time. Everybody, it's opinion time. Boom. All right. We are in opinion time. Uh, now, your lordship, do you remember what our first theory was? Hmm. Way back in the before times? That would be North Sentinel Island, where all the Sentinels come from. That's right. They're coming to get the mutants. For our Moment of Greg sequence, it was, do the Las Vegas Raiders have some kind of bias against they them? They really suck. And, yeah. They, they do. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so they, I don't know anything about the NFL at all, but I, when you said Raiders, I was like, Oakland, I had a shirt when I was in, I was one of those guys. And there was always someone that's did. like, name three players from that team or take it off. And I'm like, I, I just like the shirt. I don't know. There's Oki. There's Raider. <laughs> that's all i got yeah and uh g money when what uh when was our third subject <laughs> um five special people and their cyborg parts their cyborg parts cool mm-hmm. so uh i guess we can start with cyborgs do you guys think it's okay to have like mechanical arms that well, we kind of are control? already are we like we carry around phones and most people have their phone in their hand more than anything else so just one step away technically there. we're like one step from being there yeah you think you think it's just a matter of time before we have those things in our bodies yeah well Neuralink with elon musk man yeah that is uh that is the next step and it, ugh, it's it's a scary one because i know if someone was like hey every time there's a baby born we should put a chip in it so like if the kid ever gets abducted or whatever you just like fire up the app and you can tell where they are yeah find my child you write your name on the bottom of their foot (laughs) (laughs) yeah Yeah, just do it like everybody used to yeah i mean it's you know in a way it's it can be very good and helpful because it can help people from being mostly armless i mean (laughs) (laughs) i guess you know the thing is though like like you guys you guys are the ones that brought it up like the the guy did the guy that's like i'm gonna put an implant in my wife so i can tell if somebody else is touching her that's yeah that's was that so... consensual that's the question there Ugh. unless maybe they get off on that kind of thing totally maybe that's their thing but like i guess if you're if everybody's on board and it's all adults consenting and respectfully done mm. but still that's it's bordering kind of on it yeah. is it is it's a challenging concept for sure but do you guys think like if i have um you know if someone has like lost a hand mm-hmm. and they get like a robot hand is that is uh, not necessarily like not just a not an attachment, but a hand that could move with like yeah. mind controls hooked up to your chest muscles or something. Does that make them a cyborg? Yeah. yeah. I don't think like, so. If someone has a pacemaker, are they a cyborg? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. If someone's body is full of Kryptonian hardware, does that make them a cyborg? 
Makes yeah. it a shitty comic book, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Hot takes. Yeah. Hey-o. I don't know. Are you? But would you guys be okay with this? Like, if somebody was like, "Man, if I lost an eye or an arm, and someone was like, here, this thing works great. Do you still need an arm? Yeah, I'd take it. Yeah, like a Jordy visor. Huh? Like, if like I made, I made the eyes? joke, like being a cook. Like, if I ever lost a hand, I would just get a pair of tongs put there in place. <laughs> It's just one of the benefits of science, right? If you believe in such a thing. Oh, um, totally. You know, to help the human condition, right? Just uh, maybe stay away from putting lasers, you know, on your hand. Yeah. Yeah. No laser hands. Yeah. What is the movie? I, it, I think it's Black Panther, where in one of the movies, Andy Serkis got his hand cut off. But like Ultron, Ultron cut his hand off in one of the movies. And he's like, you get cut my hand off. Why'd you do that? And, and then, then next, he's got like a Wakanda thing. going. Yeah, on that he, right. he comes in the next movie. He's got this like hilarious flappy rubber hand. that looks so terrible. <laughs> it just looks like this big, gross, like Popeye hand. And then at one part, it opens up and there's like this cool little laser drill inside of it. Hmm. But it's the grossest like balloon, like somebody. Keep your floppy hand away from me. Yeah, oh, it's so gross to look at. Like, it's so unnerving. And he's like, he's got that heavy uh, accent. Just, I have a hand now. (laughs) Yeah, that's maybe going too far with it. I don't know. I saw a guy one time in Lethbridge who had a guitar, like an artificial hand that could hold a pick. And he would play guitar. And we were at an open stage. And I'm like, that's really cool. Like, do you just use that? Like, obviously, he just uses that for playing uh, guitar. I was like, like, are, are there hands for other things? And he's like, oh, yeah. And he had. Had like a backpack and he put his guitar hand away. I'm not making this up. He pulled out another hand that was like kind of open, like a soft like a cup. Yeah, I'm like a cup hand. hand. So he put on his cup hand and like grabbed his beer and started drinking. And I'm like, how many hands have you got in that bag? So I might have told that story on the on the podcast before. It was bizarre, but he oh, had this is the first. He had a bag of hands, and I was like, that hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. I, I bet you that guy just walks around and just like, hey, you need a hand? And then just hand someone. <laughs> <laughs> Here you go. It's the handyman. He's a real handful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so with the uh, with with this uh, NFL bias, Charles, do you have a thought? I know. On... I, it's, this is so easy, and people okay. aren't going to like my answer. Uh oh. I'm I'm open. To... Yeah. Here we go. Well, it's all rigged, anyways, isn't it? It's all just part yeah. of the script. Yeah, it's not like loop. wrestling. That's it. The NFL That's is it. so fake compared to wrestling. You have no idea. Mm-hmm. I mean, like the amount of times, and I'm, I'm I'm sure I've we've spoke on this before, but the amount of times where like a best of seven series goes to seven because it's exciting and it will sell more tickets and it's uh, worth the money to the big companies. Mm-hmm. Try to tell me that's not rigged, you know. And yeah. I, I mean, I can't remember and bring up all the facts right now, but I have definitely read a couple of things about like sumo wrestling and how that's rigged, and you know, oh. like if that's <laughs> if that's rigged, then it why not every other? I mean, the sport these big you know, national sports leagues want money. That's why they're doing it. So mm-hmm. how do you maximize your, uh, your profits? You got to rig the thing a little bit. You're not far off. Like there's another theory that like um, after nine 11 happens, that's when the Patriots won their first uh, Super Bowl and going into a dynasty and well, they're the Patriots, right? It's in the you, name. You gotta, you gotta give it to the Patriots. It's their time to shine right after a, yeah. a, a massive, uh, terrible thing like that. But you want to know who got fucked? The Raiders. The Raiders. <laughs> oh, geez. That's why you just got to have the right kind of, it's all in the branding. It was a fumble. I do got to, I got I to look something up here because I just, before I say it, I want to make sure I got the. Oh, no, man, just swing, swing, wild swings, bud. Everything I say is inaccurate. Trust me. Well, you did say that Jewel was Canadian. She's not. And she's I had from. <laughs> she's <Alaska>. not. And <laughs> yeah. Wow. Did I, I, I mean, it wasn't, it, it was like, I guess I got like four emails, which, which is four <laughs> more than I usually get, but people were like, it, there, she's not Canadian. Yeah. yeah so uh, was the championship series of, yeah. Okay. So the thing I wanted to mention just in, in line with what Charlie was saying, we've all seen the back to the future films. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now in the second back to the feature feature back to the future feature. movie i think it's the second one where michael j fox sees this thing and it's like oh he's in 2015 and oh the cubs won the world and series. the cubs won the world series the cub A's. and then so when i was living in japan my buddy dan was like this awesome friend he's still like we talk all the time and he's from chicago and he was like for years leading up to that he's like the cubs are going to win in 2015 back to the future called it and it was like the first time in like uh, over 100 years or something like that there's some kind of curse that they they, they didn't win in 15, though. They won after 16. Yeah, but they almost won. 
And I was like, this is crazy. And people were like, it's back to the future. Prophetic. Michael J. Fox was just like, people are like, could you actually see the future? He's like, I what? I'm but a man. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, we were shooting on location. So obviously it was in the future, <laughs> dummy. Uh, alternative future. Yeah. And then uh, what are you guys feeling about North Sentinel Island? You guys want to book a vacation? <laughs> <laughs> they got any hot Airbnbs out there or what? I, I got to say that if you can, if you can tell, like if, if an American guy was murdered, like blatantly murdered, his body's thrown on the rocks and they talk the government down from being like, going to get him something has to be going on there okay you know like in, in in all the classic horror movies where you go into the house and then the walls start bleeding and the house says get out mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's a good reason to get out man if you yeah, show up lazy. in this island and they continually lob arrows at you go find another island who cares yeah. Yeah, like leave them alone. But why, like they're so fiercely aggressive? Do you think they're protecting something? Yeah, themselves. Or well, okay. But do you think that they're protecting? Because even at their own detriment, like because they clearly are like, why do those people have like boats and like machines that fly and like but really they, nice we don't, weapons? We don't and know stuff? what they're thinking. Like they're like we're aliens to them, as far we're as we know. Total aliens to them. They have no. And since 1867, they've been like we haven't. They haven't veered from that course. They've been like, if anybody comes near us, we gonna kill them. Well, we also okay. don't know what, what happened to, to, to make them. Well, I don't want to say they were made that way, but like to make them react that way. Something must have happened to make them react that way. You know, like pre-1867 that nobody got to write down. Why? Because they were pelleted with a bunch of arrows. Yeah. Like people don't just end up with that kind of policy. That's like, a, like there yeah. has to be a story there. Yeah. And it, somebody ooh. showed up, tried to, to make a wreak havoc, and they were like, no, nah, not happening. You know, <laughs> it's like that... Uh, Fool me once, shame on me. Fool me yeah, twice, yeah. can't get fooled again. <laughs> <laughs> or there's actually dinosaurs there, and it's the Garden of Eden, and they're protecting us all because they're like, it's actually, not 2050 yeah. yet. That's what I'm going to believe in my heart. And then, uh, Charlie, if they are protecting some kind of mysterious thing, what do you think it would be? Well, I mean, if it's, if it's the T Rex, and the T Rex is actually a cyborg, and this T Rex cyborg is commanding them to do such things, then uh, that would make Listen the most to sense. T Rex cyborg, yeah. Yeah. Greg, do you have any idea if it was a mystery? Is there anything that jumps out that you're like, it's probably um, aliens? <laughs> <laughs> aliens. I mean, I'll tell you, I, I when you were explaining certain scenes about how they were like, they took those people and they like put them on pikes and put them on the beach kind of thing. I got some, remember, remember that one time we watched that movie, Cannibal Holocaust? Oh, yeah. Oh, geez, yeah. A crazy ass movie. <laughs> yeah. It gives me cannibal Holocaust vibes. So that's where my mind was at at the time. I was like, oh, yeah, no, they're eating people for sure. Yeah. Mm. We, uh, I only got through that once. There's not many movies I've been like, I have to shut my eyes for some of this. But there was a few scenes in that movie that I was like, I can't. Watch it was this. a real adventure yeah. to, to, to make it through with another person. Yeah. It made us stronger for, for seeing it. And then you got rid of the tape VHS immediately i did i got rid of that pretty quick i was like let's go (laughs) actually that was the weird thing was i i I was on a facebook chat and somebody was like i can't track down a copy and i'm like i got one off of ebay or whatever it was yeah yeah yeah. and so i sold it to this guy off marketplace and i was like this is weird right this is weird i'll sell this to you please never contact me again yeah Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) i didn't even i lived in an apartment building at the time i left it at the front and I just left it there and like he uh, sent me a knee transfer for it. And I was like, okay, it's, it's out the front door of the building. I didn't tell him what, what number I was in the building. Cause I was like, I don't want anything to do with this guy. Like just in case he was hungry. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> you have a copy of cannibal Holocaust. I'm coming to get it. Yeah. Also like, you know, like, like back to what Charlie was saying, like how pissed off would you be with these bunch of yokels showing up with a bunch of coconuts? Like, Oh, what's you guys this? never seen a coconut before. Here what's you go. The stupidest gift. Hey, you guys living on an island with all these tropical trees. You want some more things that we made from our tropical trees? Yeah, I'd, I'd be pissed too. I, I'd, I'd shoot arrows at you. Like the one time we give you a chance and you give us a yeah. thing that we already have plenty of. <laughs> no. Arrow. Well, already then, then cyborg friends, uh, thank you so much for swinging by. Uh, a little pro tip here. If you do want to make banana chips in the oven, uh, just to share my little family recipe here that I got from the Googles. Uh, you set your oven to 225. You chop your bananas up into thin slices, spread them on parchment paper. I'm a little crazy, so I brush them with some lemon juice. You could also use some cinnamon if you're a bloody lunatic. And uh, you make sure that those slices are not touching. If they're touching, oh, you bake for 30 to 90 minutes. 
and then you don't burn them like I do every time. And uh, you're going to have some good food. So we uh, we sure do appreciate you swinging by. And we sure do hope that you swing by again for episode 13. In the meantime, if you're needing some beeswax on your income tax, then slide into our past cast and social media stuff at it's a conspiracy And uh, we'll see you soon. So take care. Talk to you soon. Bye. See you never. Da 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 da